The group here could, uh, would enjoy a longer discussion with some of the topics that Justin addressed and hopefully we'll have time for that later. I am going to switch gears now and talk about uh, something we have. I haven't heard anybody mention soil nutrient availability in all the discussions we've had so far today about plant herbivore interactions. And so what I'm going to talk about is the relationship between grazing and nitrogen cycling. And I'm going to really focus on the role that herbivores can play in uh, redistributing nutrients in landscapes. So I think a main focus here has been on how do we manage the spatial distribution of herbivores? How do we manage the spatial distribution of, um, of cattle in landscapes? And so what I'm going to present are two case studies looking at what the consequences of that management can be for nitrogen cycling. Uh, before I get started, I should uh, acknowledge Dan Milchunas. Uh, he uh, has contributed a lot of the information that I'll present on the short grass portion of this talk. So um, let me figure out how to switch. There we go. So a quick road map here. Uh, first, I'll give a little, uh, just a brief general background on nitrogen cycling and rangelands. And then what I'll do in this talk today is present two case studies. First one's going to be on grazing and nitrogen cycling in East African rangeland. And the second one's going to be on grazing and nitrogen cycling in short grass steppe. And uh, there's nothing special about nitrogen cycling in either of these two locations. I'm just going to present these two case studies because they're the only two rangeland ecosystems that I've worked in and the only two that I have data for. And actually, I think they're really two of the only in the world that I think there's been a sufficient amount of research done that we can uh, really quantify the role that grazers can play in the nitrogen cycle. So for the East African rangeland per, per, uh, part of it, that's the work that I've done for my dissertation. And uh, I'll, I'll look at spatial redistribution of nitrogen by cattle and by native ungulates, and also present some consequences for forage production. And in the second half, I'll review some past work that's been done in the short grass step on cattle management and nitrogen and then uh, build upon that past research with some uh, updated perspectives on uh, spatial redistribution of nitrogen. So this is a kind of schematic you often see people present, uh, biogeochemists, when they're talking about what's the nitrogen cycle in any kind of ecosystem. Uh, I'm not going to talk about any of the arrows there, fortunately, but the uh, only thing I want to say is that in semi-arid rangelands, um, you don't have anything leaching out the bottom of these ecosystems in general, dry, semi-arid, so you don't lose nitrogen through leaching. You have inputs from the atmosphere, outputs through various gaseous forms, and then lots of transformations going on in the soil. And I say this is fairly typical because uh, almost any example of what is the nitrogen cycle of in, a, in any given ecosystem around the world, you don't see herbivores in these uh, diagrams. So very rarely do we consider the role that grazing can play. Uh, and so what I've done uh, for short grass step, if we take all these gaseous outputs that are represented in this diagram and sum them together, and then just take wet and dry deposition. Those are the two main, the main forms of input and output of nitrogen uh, if we don't consider cattle. And I've summarized those here. And what I'm going to do in today's talk is I'm going to keep coming back to this diagram, both for the East African perspective and the shortgrass perspective. Uh, in shortgrass step, you basically get about five kilograms of nitrogen per hectare inputs from atmospheric deposition. And you lose right now based on tw um, 20, 25 years of research on the four different forms of gas fluxes that you see here that contain nitrogen. We now uh, just have, I think, enough, uh, a fairly decent estimate of all four of those pathways so we can say we lose approximately three and a half kilograms through those pathways. So the question I want to ask is, uh, does grazing management influence nitrogen enough uh, to really uh, reconcile the difference that we see between inputs and outputs? Here, what we'd predict is that a short grass step should be accumulating about around a kilogram and a half of nitrogen annually. And uh, we probably, that probably isn't happening. And I think that the cattle management uh, plays a role in why that isn't happening. OK, so two perspectives. I don't know if that's cut off a little bit. But uh, first, I'll, t I'll show some work with uh, uh, some work that I've done in central Kenyan rangelands and then short grass step. So Laikipia district in Kenya, this is uh, in the central portion of the country. It's in the rain shadow of Mount Kenya, just like we're in the rain, sh rain shadow of uh, the Rockies here. 
Uh, fairly large district, all of it is managed for commercial beef production, uh, no, na no national parks or natural areas. Uh, this is one of the few areas that at Independence, most of the ranches remained in uh, European ownership and still are today. And uh, cattle distribution, these are all large ranches, and in the entire district there's no fences between, the, there's no fences between ranches and there's no fences within ranches. So cattle distribution is managed primarily by herders that are hired and through a BOMA system that I'll talk about in a minute. It's a nutrient poor rangeland, uh, deep sandy soils, and about 500 millimeters mean annual precipitation. So a little more music than here, but more uh, similar precipitation to far eastern Colorado. Of course, it's tropical, so production is considerably higher. Uh, this few things changed, but this is just to show you the location of the, the ranch where I did most of my work, and again in the rain shadow of Mount Kenya. Uh, and cattle are not the only important herbivores here. Uh, there's a very high diversity, there's 18 ungulate species on the ranch. Um, five most important grazers are shown here, and really, uh, numerically, the ones that really matter are cattle and impala. A impala is a medium-sized antelope, very similar to a mule deer, and they're occurring at average densities of around 50 per square kilometer or 50 per square mile on the ranch. So, quite abundant, and because they're uh, primarily grazers during the growing season, uh, browsers during the dry seasons, they're important in terms of grass consumption. Uh, the other species, uh, water buck, I, I think they're kind of the elk of elk of Africa, at least remind me of them, and then Grevy zebra are uh, a much larger species of zebra than the common plain zebra that most people are familiar with on the IUCN red list, and uh, much of the world's population occurs on these uh, privately owned cattle ranches. And then Cape buffalo, um, those are very rare. All three of these species, uh, less than one per square kilometer, so in terms of grass consumption, not very important. So I'll really talk about impala and cattle. So uh, all the cattle in this district on all the ranches are managed uh, by a BOMA system. If you leave your cattle out grazing over, overnight, uh, one of the problems is they'll usually get stolen in a couple days. Cattle are pretty valuable there, and uh, so all cattle need to be brought in at night, and they only graze during 12 hours of the day. Uh, build these brush ring corrals where cattle are placed at night. Uh, one of the consequences of this system, of course, is that cattle are grazing 12 hours a day, they're excreting nitrogen, dung, and urine 24 hours a day, and so about half of what they consume ends up in these bomas. Uh, the manure layer in these things will build up considerably over time. Eventually, they'll be abandoned, moved to a new site, and this can develop uh, after it is abandoned into a very nutrient-rich plant community. So one of the things we did, we looked at a chrono sequences of these glades that appear in the landscape, very nutrient-rich, um, soils with a, a very palatable perennial grass growing on them. And we showed that these patches are actually derived from abandoned cattle bomas. And so uh, even uh, several decades, usually one decade after a, a, a boma is abandoned, it's finally recolonized by perennial grasses. And even uh, 40 plus years, probably up to 100 plus years after abandonment, these persist as nutrient rich patches in the landscape. Now, as you can see in these photos, um, shrubs do uh, occupy a lot of the landscape. I'm not going to talk about shrubs, mainly because measuring nitrogen dynamics in places with shrubs is a lot more expensive and difficult than measuring it in grasslands. But I am going to talk about uh, uh, nitrogen uh, dynamics in grassland patches that occur on the nutrient-poor soils that surround these, uh, these nutrient-rich, uh, what I refer to as long-term glades. So these are just, just a closer up view of the two grassland communities that we studied. Uh, the first one, upper one's dominated by Cynodon plectostachius, the lower one by Cynodon dactylon and Digitaria melangiana. All of these are perennial stoloniferous grasses, all of them fairly palatable. Uh, these represent about 1% of the landscape and this community represents about 25% of the landscape. And much of the work that we did looked at the effects of grazers. It says the effects of grazers on above ground net primary production, or I should more correctly say uh, above ground net herbaceous production, uh, soil nitrogen availability. And then the third thing we looked at is how herbivores influence nitrogen inputs and losses from these patches in the landscape.
Uh, we measured production and we, with movable grazing cages, moving them every month, and then uh, we'd start late in the dry season, set these up, and we would also put uh, mineralization tubes in the ground, and I'll show you some data from uh, inorganic or, or resin bags that would absorb inorganic nitrogen in the soil, and we'd move those every time that we'd move a grazing cage. Wait for it to rain, things to green up, uh, and move our grazing cages monthly, measure production inside and outside of uh, permanent exclosures this way. Uh, this is just a, uh, shows you the effects of grazing uh, inside and outside exclosures on above ground herbaceous production for nutrient rich glades and for nutrient poor uh, grasslands in 2001. This is summed over the growing season and what we see is there was a significant positive effect of grazing on productivity uh, in the nutrient rich situation and a significant negative effect of productivity on uh, a sig significant negative effect of grazing on productivity in the nutrient poor situation. Uh, the, this is across, uh, and the study sites that are across a precipitation gradient. So there was a lot of variation among study sites, but the within study site effect was consistent across all of the sites and very significant. This switch from a positive effect here to a negative effect here. Um, what we were interested in is how this is linked to nutrient availability in the soil. And so uh, where we had a positive effect of grazers on productivity, that's the same data there on the left from the nutrient rich sites. Uh, we also had a positive effect of grazers on soil nitrogen availability. Uh, this is inorganic nitrogen availability in the soil uh, during the growing season. Where we had a negative effect of grazing on productivity, we also, grazers also had a negative effect on soil, nutrient, soil nitrogen availability. So, Effects on nitrogen availability in the short term, parallel effects on productivity. The third thing we're interested in is uh, a longer scale uh, look at how grazers are affecting the nitrogen budget. And so I'll return to this diagram. And uh, we tried to quantify these two areas, ar arrows here. How much nitrogen is going into animals and how much is coming out in dung and urine within a given site. And the difference between these two represents spatial nitrogen re redistribution because of herbivores moving among patches in the landscape. And then we also uh, had to account for uh, likely losses of nitrogen through ammonia volatilization from urine patches. So what we see in nutrient-rich patches, there's nutrient-rich glades, uh, rates of nitrogen consumption, all the numbers shown in this diagram are grams of nitrogen per square meter. So six grams of nitrogen per square meter consumption, nine grams of nitrogen per square meter deposition in dung and urine. Now, how is that possible? How can they be eating less than they're depositing? Well, that's because there's a spatial redistribution. Herbivores are not just using these sites for consumption, but during dry seasons, when there is no grazing on the sites, impala in particular continue to use these sites for bedding, for social interactions, and there are still very high rates of dung and urine deposition throughout the dry season. And as a result, uh, impala represented a net nitrogen input to these nutrient-rich patches in the landscape. And so if we sum up uh, deposition as well as these inputs and outputs, we found that there was a net input from herbivores of 1.56 grams of nitrogen per square meter on average. This is averaged across four study sites. Um, that's a pretty big number. I mean, I'm sure to most of you, you don't think in terms of grams of nitrogen per square meter, but in terms of atmospheric deposition, the amount coming in and wet, and wet deposition here is very small compared to the influence of herbivores on the budget here. Uh, in the nutrient poor patches in the landscape, uh, different situation. Consumption far exceeded deposition in dung and urine. That's because in these sites, most of the consumption is occurring by cattle. And cattle, of course, are grazing 12 hours, and about half of their intake is being redeposited uh, or spatially redistributed back to uh, cattle bomas at night. Of course, those bomas eventually are abandoned, and then those nutrients uh, do become uh, part of the available forage uh, further on into the future. <coughs> 
So some conclusions from this. Uh, first of all, grazer effects on nitrogen budgets, nitrogen cycling rates, and above ground herbaceous production are closely coupled in their direction, uh, their magnitude, and their spatial extent. Uh, we see positive effects on end cycling and production in nutrient rich glades where impala represent a net nitrogen input and we see negative effects on end cycling and production in nutrient poor grassland patches where cattle create a net nitrogen drain. So, uh, I mean, one of the main implications here is that rotation of boma -like locations over time sustains nutrient rich patches on the landscape and uh, Pro, uh, factors that may result in increased sedentarization of pastoralists or the use of more permanent bomas on commercial ranches can create a nutrient drain for the eco ecosystem. When people, when ranch managers are thinking about where they're going to put their next boma, how often they're rotating them, they're not thinking at all about uh, nitrogen. They're thinking about a, a ton of other factors that influence their operation, but that decision has a major effect on uh, nutrient redistribution in the landscape. Okay, so now I'll switch back to something that's uh, probably more familiar to most of the folks here and try to present a, a somewhat parallel picture for the shortgrass steppe. Um, as I said, uh, there has been a lot of past work or some past work done on nitrogen cycling in shortgrass steppe and I'll start with that and then uh, present some um, newer estimates of what may be happening here. Uh, the work I'll present is from the Central Plains Experimental Range, just about an hour northeast of here, 16,000 acre property uh, managed by the Agricultural Research Service that I work for now, and has had long-term grazing studies since 1939. Uh, I'm going to talk about specifically about grow, uh, pastures that are grazed during the growing season, so continuous grazing from May to October. Uh, most of our pastures are 160 or 320 acres, and it's a uh, a little bit drier site compared to the African uh, situation I just presented. So first of all, uh, this is a map of spatial redistribution of nitrogen the, uh, on, uh, on a 320 acre pasture at the uh, Central Plains Experimental Range. This comes from a dissertation by uh, Richard Semft in 1983 and part of a study that was led by Larry Rittenhouse. And, uh, uh, a tremendous amount of work went into constructing this map. The amount of information that was necessary, I'll talk about it in a minute, uh, was really labor intensive to produce a, a picture like this. And what they showed is these portions of the pasture here, here, here are areas where cattle are taking in more nitrogen than they're excreting. And these portions of the pasture, the corners and the fence tank, or, and then the water tank right here are where there's a really large rate of uh, net inputs of nitrogen from cattle. To get a picture like this, and this is the, the entire dissertation was done to construct uh, this kind of picture here. So what you need to know to present, to put this together, is you got to know the spatial distribution of nitrogen intake by cattle, you got to know the spatial distribution of nitrogen de deposition by cattle, and then uh, to really put that in perspective, you want to be able to compare that to atmospheric and, input, and inputs and uh, N-loss pathways. I uh, point out that these two, these two things here, uh, we've really increased our knowledge and our ability to estimate these over the past 20 years. So I'll present some updated estimates on those. Uh, and we've also done some work to uh, look at this in more detail in multiple pastures and uh, look at this in more detail in, in multiple pastures. Um, one of the things I did this past year was start using GPS collars on yearling steers in pastures at Central Plains Experimental Range as part of a number of experiments that we're doing there. And uh, I'll show you some results from that. We can use those collars to uh, measure the time that uh, individual cattle spend in different portions of the pasture and really the, the pattern that jumps out when you look at the data right away is how much time they spend in fence corners and at, cat, at water points. So I'll just focus on that today. And one of the nice things, a number of studies have shown that ex nitrogen excretion by cattle is a fairly it's independent of their behavior and so we can assume that deposition is in proportion to the time that they spend in different portions of the pasture. And then I'll look at some different methods that we can use to estimate an intake. 
uh, and relate that to stocking rate. So these are just, uh, here's on the left, 320 acre pasture, on the right, 160 acre pasture. Um, this is three weeks of GPS collar data from a steer, uh, from three, three weeks of collar data from three steers in the pasture, uh, and we're collecting a fix every five minutes so we can look fairly detailed at what the, where the animals are. And uh, the red points are within 50 meters of fence corners and the blue points are within 100 meters of a water point in the corner or 75 meters of a water point that's not in the corner. And then the green points are remainder of the, of the fixes. Uh, what you can see is they spend a considerable amount of time, a disproportionate amount of time in the corners and water points. Um, and this just summarizes it. So we've got, uh, we had two 320 acre pastures where we sampled the steers in May and July, and then three where we sampled them in June and August. Uh, around 11 to 12,000 fixes per animal. And uh, on average, there is variability here. Uh, on average, they spend 27% of their time in only 2.5% of the pasture. So this is where you can get significant amount of spatial redistribution of nitrogen as a result of this kind of behavior. Um, one thing I should also point out is there's very little variation among steers within a pasture, much larger va variation among pastures. So second thing you need to do to look at redistribution of nitrogen is have some measurements of N intake that we can uh, uh, relate to stocking rate. Uh, this is not an easy uh, measurement to make. Uh, certainly that early study that I showed that, uh, that is one of the best estimates I've seen for shortgrass step of nitrogen intake rates on a monthly basis on shortgrass step. Um, I used two methods to estimate it. First of all, uh, Dan Milchunas and the uh, long-term ecological research program that works out there has been measuring grazing cages, inside and outside grazing cages annually, uh, 1992 through 2004. We can use that, those measurements of plant production inside and outside grazing cages and nitrogen content to estimate consumption rates. So I did that for the 13 years of data that were available. And uh, that's what we see right here. Uh, on average, they're consuming around 3.2 kilograms, 3.3 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare. Uh, you know, obviously, it's much lower in drought years. Uh, 2002, 2000 it goes down. It's much higher in uh, years with above average rainfall. Uh, the numbers you see over here are just an extrapolation. These are not a measurement, just an extrapolation to heavy stocking rates based on uh, what we use for heavy stocking at Central Plains Experimental Range. Uh, 4.3 kilograms of nitrogen estimated for consumption there. That's really all that matters is these two numbers right here. And then I did uh, a different method of estimating nitrogen, in nitrogen intake, basically the method used by uh, Richard Senf to, uh, as to get monthly, monthly estimates of N intake on shortgrass rangeland from during the growing season and then just multiply that by the actual stocking rates that we've used at Central Plains Experimental Range, moderate stocking and heavy stocking and the actual number of days we've had them in those pastures for that 13 year period. Here we get a slightly lower estimate of intake, um, 3.28 versus 2.56. So these are significantly different. The animal based estimate is lower but I was actually reassured at how close those were. I thought um, they'd come up come, those, these are two totally independent methods of measuring this and I thought they'd be uh, quite further apart than they actually were. So that was actually a bit re reassuring to me. Uh, this is just summarizes that. So I think all we can say is that at moderate stocking rates, uh, the consumption of nitrogen bike, uh, sorry, the consumption of nitrogen is somewhere in this ballpark and at heavy stocking rates, the consumption of nitrogen is somewhere in this ballpark for short grass step range. We put this back into this picture then, I average the plant and animal based estimates and this is what we get for a moderately stocked pasture. In fact, uh, we look at this difference 5 versus 3.5, the difference is one and a half kilograms and this is made up uh, primarily by uh, losses to cattle. We can measure this quite accurately because we weigh all the cattle. Uh, this is my estimate based on the combining the GPS color data with the mismatch, uh, uh, with the uh, estimate of intake here and the mismatch in terms of how much time they're spending in the corners. So what I, really what I've done is construct a budget for 
nitrogen balance in the situation where, where they're, for the 97 and a half percent of the pasture where cattle spend most of their time grazing versus the water points and fence corners where they mostly spend their time standing around. And uh, what you see here, at moderate stocking rates, we're, we're about balanced. There's slight nitrogen uh, net positive balance in that system, and then there's really heavy rates of eutrophication, which I think most of you who have been out there can, can smell any time you're out in the corner of a, of a pasture. Um, if we go to the uh, heavy stocking rate, uh, same set of calculations here, and what we see now we've uh, turned that majority of the pasture into net nitrogen balance. Annually you're losing a little bit of nitrogen each year, uh, and then you're uh, even more severely eutrophying those corners. So really what this is, um, there's, I haven't done any analysis of uncertainty in all these estimates. Certainly there's uncertainty here. And as a result, there's you know, some uncertainty here as well. But what we see is that at heavy stocking rates, and uh, to address the question earlier, this is 3.8 acres per AUM. There we think we're en we've entered into the region where we're, we're actually causing a net loss of nitrogen from the rangeland on an annual basis. And this is just really uh, a lot of wasted nutrients. So conclusion, spatial end redistribution by cattle can affect the long-term nitrogen balance of short grass steppe. Permanent fence corners and water points uh, represent significant nitrogen drains for the ecosystem. Uh, and methods that, uh, to shift cattle concentration points over time, perhaps some things like uh, rotating the water sources that we actually use over time may enhance our ability first to retain nitrogen in the system, but then also to convert that soil nitrogen into animal protein. Um, that's all I'll say. I would like to thank a couple of other collaborators. Sam McNaughton from Syracuse University was co-author on much of the African work and Justin Derner provided all the stocking rate data and weight gains for those calculations and a number of other folks provided a lot of the data for the short grass step calculations. So thanks and I'd be happy to answer questions. Yeah? So all my calculations are for pastures that are grazed from May 15th to October 15th, when there really isn't, isn't much need for protein supplementation. Um, that was part of the work that Richard Semp and Larry Rittenhouse did, and it certainly uh, complicates it. It's much easier to do the calculations without protein supplementation. Um, really, there's not a lot going on. Winter grazed pastures, it's a totally different story. So winter grazed pastures, there's not much going on with cattle and nitrogen. The real action is going to occur in pastures that are consistently grazed during the summer. Yeah? So could you, sorry, could you say that again? Soil capabilities for intake and water cycling, how does that, how does that affect your study? I think that's going to be highly contingent on the types of soils you're, you're working with and their uh, potential to form a soil, a sealed layer at the surface. Um, I would say that uh, in the African example, the soils that dominate that landscape can form a sealed surface if you lose too much of the uh, a litter layer. And uh, that is a, a, a pretty big problem. And those nutrient rich patches uh, where you've had that manure input, even you know, 40, 50, 60 years later, there's still a sufficient organic matter in that surface layer that it does have much better rates of, of water infiltration after a big storm event. It's not something we measured, but you can see it. You don't see runoff on those nutrient-rich patches. You do see runoff consistently on very heavily grazed uh, nutrient-poor patches. And again, it's the same soil texture, but uh, without that organic matter content, it has a higher propensity to form that seal. Your, your texture, what were the textures? They were around 75% sand, so pretty high sand content. Yes, certainly. <coughs> Further questions for David? We've got plenty of time. Did you test the soil nitrogen content to see if it corresponded with your study? Or? For the African work? No. Or 
Uh, we do have one long-term exclosure in the in the uh, heavily grazed pasture at uh, CPR, and I haven't I haven't looked at that. But yeah, that's something we would expect. I think one of the things is we have some limited replication in our ability to do that. But. Oh, I think in those in the African example, uh, it's already. I think it occurs very quickly. Uh, those, the level of grazing, the grazing intensity that you have on those nutrient poor patches, and the, the magnitude of nitrogen removal is th those numbers are substantial. And I think you know even on a decadal or less than a decade time scale, there are already significant feedbacks there. Now there, I didn't talk about lots of other plant communities. There's a real shift. That's a very heterogeneous landscape. And the shrubs come in, shrubs colonize patches that are severely overgrazed. Once the shrubs are in, cattle can't get their head in there, and the grass layer comes back. So that's a, that's a very patchy system. Yeah. Said, would you expect, what would you expect from the short grass step? Would you expect that to be similar or longer? Uh, so the number, if you look at the numbers, the number of grazed patches is about 100 acres. Okay. Yeah. So the number, if you look at the numbers that I presented there, for that, those numbers to make a difference, it's definitely a much longer term effect. It's got to be, um, you know, 50 to 100 year. Cumulative effect. On the uh, the bonus that were abandoned, and uh, you said that their basically their nitrogen content was increased, and the plants that came back in were did you note at all were they mostly like annual forbs, annual grasses, and how did that have an effect on the nitrogen content of the plant cycle? Well, that's just a really simple community there. There's a couple annual forb species that are adapted to colonizing those very early on, you know, three to five years after. I mean, there's some, I mean, this is a, this is a several foot manure layer, so it's not like um, things uh, de develop on that uh, rapidly, but three to five years you get some annual forbs, but typically about 10 years after abandonment you get uh, full colonization by uh, cynodon, which is a perennial stoloniferous grass, and then cynodon just stays indefinitely. I had it the other way around, but uh, moderate was 5.1 acres per AUM and heavy was 3.8 acres per AUM. I think the heavy uh, is actually pretty typical of what ha much of what goes on around here. I mean, we call that heavy, but I don't, I don't know if that's a very apt description. If, yeah. In the African example, the total production on the on the nitrogen enriched areas, did you balance that with the depleted areas? In other words, is there a total loss of production? I can't balance that because about a third of the landscape is shrub dominated and we don't have the numbers there. Most of those shrubs uh, are potential end fixers and that's why we didn't work Would in that. guess be that you're losing a bunch of production? Uh, I think we're losing production in a portion of the landscape. We are gaining that back in another portion, so. But no guess on the balance. On the balance, um, it's not, uh, it's hard to say uh, because it's not a direct one-to-one -one with those two communities. So. Any more questions? Let's give David a hand. All right, thanks.